Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. the viewers. I am Dr. Priyanka Singh, Assistant Professor, Department of Political Science, DAV PG College and this is my third lecture. In this lecture, I will focus on liberalism and its various variants in the study of international relations. In the previous two lectures, I have talked about emergence of international relations as an academic discipline. I have focused on the different stages of international relations, the principles of international relations and the theory of idealism and realism. In the theory of idealism, I emphasized upon how human nature and international politics is interrelated and how we can see an optimistic view of human nature. In the theory of realism, I discussed on the thing that how we have to see international relations from the point of view of realism because realism teaches us to see the things as they are. And in this lecture, I will be talking about liberalism and its variants. To begin with, theory of liberalism. What is liberalism? Liberalism has been originated from the word liberal. Liberalism basically focuses on the freedom. It focuses on individual it focuses on their growth. So, basically liberalism can be considered as the first school of thought of international relations. How? Because liberalism is a refined view of idealism. The theory of idealism that I have already talked about in the first lecture. Liberalism is its refined version and that is the reason that it is considered as the first school of thought of international relations. Now, if you uh, talk about the growth of the theory of liberalism, it has multi-dimensional tradition that can be dated back to 17th and 18th century. But all these multidimensional traditions could not achieve their objective. What was their objective? Their objective was to ensure world peace. So, basically liberalism focuses on world peace. They view international politics from optimistic point of view, unlike realism. And their point of view led to the growth of institutions such as League of Nation. And it is because of institutions such as League of Nation that liberalism could not achieve its objective. Because this institution had certain flaws. Although we cannot claim that it was liberalism that was responsible for the failure of League of Nation. Because the League of Nation was made by statesmen, made by leaders and it had certain flaws 
and that was the reason that it could not avoid second world war and that was the main reason for its failure. That is why liberalism gone through different phases. So, because of its failure in the form of League of Nations, there has been decline of the school of thought of liberalism and liberalism was considered as, termed as an utopian idea like idealism. The way idealism says that we have to see good in everything. Human nature may have certain flaws, but it is basically good. We have to strive to make the environment better because it is the environment that is leading to human nature being bad. So, what is this? This is an op this is an basically utopian idea an idealist idea and because liberalism is a defined version of idealism, it is also considered as utopian, idealist. So, basically liberal school of thought gained legitimacy after the end of the cold war. During the time of the cold war, it had certain good phases, certain bad phases. So, there was up and down, but with the expansion of globalization and along with that liberalization and privatization, liberalism flourished. The end of the cold war is marked as the end of the history, the end of the history and the last man by Francis Fukuyama become very famous concept and it led to the recognition of supremacy of liberalism. So, we can say that the core concern of liberals is to bring peace and prosperity. We have to see good in everything, we have to be optimistic in nature. So, liberals strive for peace and prosperity unlike realism that emphasizes upon competition, that emphasizes upon conflict, that emphasizes upon war. So, in contrast to realism, liberalism works for bringing peace, it strives for cooperation it strives for development of all, welfare of all, peaceful coexistence. These are the main crux of liberalism. So, coming to the pillars of liberal world order, if you term any country as a liberal country, any world order as a liberal world order, these pillars should be there. So, first and foremost requirement for liberal world order is positive view of human nature. We cannot view human nature as selfish like realists do. They say human nature is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, short, but liberals term human nature as positive in nature, human nature is good like idealism. So, the they believe that international relations can be cooperative, it need not to be always conflictual in nature. What realists believe that human nature is conflictual in nature and that is the reason that liberals reject the notion that power politics is the only outcome of international relations. All the different branches of realism, whether it is classical realism, whether it is neo realism, whether it is neo classical realism, where it is 
post colonial realism all the different branches of realism they emphasizes the fact that there is always power politics but liberals reject that notion they say that power politics can't be the only outcome of international relations there can be the outcome in the form of cooperation there can be outcome in the form of peace there can be the outcome in the form of prosperity why to emphasize only on the power politics and thus liberalism believe in free market economy because until and unless we make the market free we can't say that we are living in a liberal world order because this market will lead to interdependence among nations nations will be interdependent and what this interdependence will do this interdependence will make nations even if they don't want this interdependence will compel them to cooperate and this cooperation in turn into peace prosperity welfare of all so liberals believe in proliferation of democracies because they believe that democracies don't go for war no war if democracy is there they will not go for war they will be peaceful to each other they will be respectful to each other because democracies believe in the principle of the freedom of individual to the people by the people for the people so it is individual that is important you can say that okay realist also believe in human nature they also give importance to humans but if you remember i discussed in the theory of realism that their first principle is statism state is important but in the theory of liberalism it is individual that matters so they believe in the proliferation of democracies they believe in the protection of human rights the rights which we get because we are born as humans every human has certain rights which are not given to any other living being we get those rights because we are born as humans liberalism also believe in international organizations and institutions although they don't claim for world government because we have not achieved that goal the their larger goal is to have a world government but we have not achieved we have not gone so far but they believe in the growth of international organizations because these international organizations will lead to more and more interaction and this interaction will lead to coexistence respect for each other they believe in more people to people contact when people meet with each other if they have some certain grudges that can be resolved so meeting is important contact is important and how we can achieve that contact through free flow of goods services and people free movement of people no border barriers so border the liberals believe that border should be made irrelevant their importance should be diminished and they believe in progress and for progress there is a need for peace 
we can't claim progress in the situation of war. To achieve progress, to achieve prosperity, we have to keep our world free from war. So, these are the major pillars of international relations from the point of view of liberals. Now, coming to the intellectual influence on liberalism. So, John Locke, Immanuel Kant, Woodrow Wilson, Richard Cobden, Normal Angel, Carl Deutsch, David Mitrani, Robert Cuhan and Joseph Nye. All these scholars has contributed in establishing the principle of liberalism. If you talk about the origin of liberalism, the credit goes to John Locke. He is regarded as the most influential philosophers and he is widely acknowledged as the father of liberalism. John Locke ideas on natural rights, government, human nature has shaped the development of liberalism. His work that is two treatises of government, he defended the claim that men are by nature free and equal. Every individual is free and everybody is equal. So, there is no dissimilarity and if there is no dissimilarity, there is no point of fighting with each other. He is emphasized on the concept of life, liberty and property. Life is important, liberty is important and property is important. So, he argued that people have rights and rights basically three rights, life, liberty and property. And that is the reason that John Locke is considered as the father of liberalism. So, we can trace the origin of liberalism from the work of John Locke. Next important contributor in the field of liberalism is Immanuel Kant. Immanuel Kant is said to be that person who forms the backbone of liberal thinking. What international relations is today, Immanuel Kant has significantly contributed in making liberalism what it is today. He wrote Perpetual Peace in 1795 and in that work he begins with the premise that international system was indeed somewhat akin to state of nature and what is that state of nature? Anarchic and competitive. So, what is pre-given to us and state of nature which is anarchic and competitive. He do not claim that we have is received a state of nature which is very peaceful, but mankind has got that power to overcome this state of nature. And how we can overcome that state of nature? By finding a state of peace that is a perpetual peace without war. So, we can say that like uh, in the theory of John Locke, John Locke gave the also contributed in the theory of social contract, Hobbes, Locke and Rousseau all three have contributed in the theory of social contract. So, John Locke has assumed the state of nature as peaceful because during his times he saw glorious revolution which was a peaceful revolution. So, he saw a state of nature which was peaceful in nature and that is the reason that he claimed for life, liberty and property. So, he gave a very optimistic view of state of nature, but Immanuel Kant says that 
okay in the state of nature there is anarchy there is competition but human kind has got that potential to change that state of nature and human kind can bring that state of nature in a state of peace a perpetual peace without war kant was the believer of good nature of human like idealist school of thought says so so he argued that humans are rational whatever they do they have a reason for that and they understand the fact that it is more profitable to cooperate rather than go to conflict or war because in conflict nobody gains not even the victors everybody is a loser so better to be in a situation where there is peace better to avoid that situation of war and can't believe that human nature has got that reason to calculate that what are the benefits to be in a peaceful situation rather than a war like situation so kant says that personal safety and property are very important and very valuable assets then life of human beings to save that property to have personal safety they understand that we have to avoid war because war has its own cost thus in a republican state people will vote against war people will not go for war because they are rational and when they are rational they understand that it is more profitable to cooperate next is woodrow wilson so woodrow wilson idea of liberalism is a mixture of idealism and pragmatism what is pragmatism to have a practical point of view so he gave the idea of liberal institutionalism he believed in the institutions and he also gave the idea of collective security because institutions provide us collective security they ensure our safety they ensure our security they are the guarantor of peace and national self determination wilson also strived for national self determination so he heralded world peace and in his concept in the process of that he gave the concept of league of nation although usa could not join league of nation because of us congress but it was woodrow wilson who proposed that idea to have league of nation to avoid further war because the world already beared the bond of war first world war and he also gave 14 points program for usa now prominent liberal theories what are the prominent liberal theories first is the liberal institutionalism that woodrow wilson gave its idea sociological liberalism functionalism democratic peace theory interdependence theory or complex interdependence which is also called cobb web model we will discuss all these theories one by one to begin with liberal institutionalism so the concept of liberal institution the idea of liberal institutionalism was suggested by woodrow wilson in his famous 14 points program 
and he took that idea from domestic politics. So, in the words of Woodrow Wilson, the institutions can convert the jungle of international politics into zoo. What does that mean? That mean that okay, there are animals, but those animals can be risk for each other in jungle, not in the zoo. So, even if there is problem between states, if institution is there, these institution can give them a platform where they can interact with each other, where they can think about the their own welfare which in turn will lead to welfare of each other, where they can remove their grudges towards each other. So, these institutions are very important because they can convert a jungle into a zoo. So, now, what are the advantages of building institutions? First, platform for interaction and communication because until and unless we interact, we communicate, we cannot develop trust. And if the trust will not develop, if there will be trust deficit, that will lead to war. And one war will lead to another war. And that will be a vicious circle of war, where it will become difficult for states to come out of that vicious circle. So, better to avoid that situation and how we will be able to avoid that situation with the help of institutions, because these institutions will provide a platform to communicate with each other, to resolve our problems, whatever problems we have with each other, we can resolve them with the help of interaction and communication and we can settle our disputes peacefully, peaceful settlement of disputes. If any dispute is there, we can resolve them peacefully. It is not necessary that we have to go for war and declare ourselves as victors, then only one our problem will get resolved. Institutionalism, institutions believe in the fact that if any country make any commitment at the international level, it is not easy to break that commitment. It is not easy to come out of that commitment. Why? Because there is a pressure of world public opinion. What the world will think about that particular nation? That it is a promise broker? Do not believe in that country. So, in present times, scholars like Robert Cuhan, Joseph Nye also support the fact that there is need to bring institutions, because these institutions will lead to moral pressure. And because of this moral pressure, countries will not go for war. Then the English school of thought, where Hedley Bull has a major contribution through his book Anarchical Society. In this book, Hedley Bull has emphasized and acknowledged the transformation that has happened in international politics because of the growth of institutions, international law and regimes. Because according to Hedley Bull, the growth of institutions, international law, inter international regimes has 
converted anarchy into anarchical society. These two words anarchy and society, these both are completely opposite to each other. When there is anarchy, there cannot be society. Where there is society, there cannot be anarchy. But Hedley Bull says that with the help of institutions, international law, international regimes, we can have anarchical society. Because anarchy is pre given, what we can do is that we can change that through our effort. But serious effort is needed. Our intention to change that situation is needed. So, international politics cannot be a complete society. We cannot claim that we will convert international politics into society because society is organized. But international politics is not because it is anarchical in nature. But we have to move out of that complete anarchy. So, anarchical society. Next is the concept of sociological liberalism, which is also called cultural liberalism. So, sociological liberalism basically rejects the view that international relations is the study of relations between government or sovereign states. They reject the fact that interaction should only be between the government. A state is the most important component like realism do, because realism focuses on three as that is statism, survival and self-help. So, as per the sociological liberalism or cultural liberalism, this view that international politics is relation between government and sovereign states, it is a narrow view of international relations. And we have to look into a more broader picture, because as per sociological liberalism, international relations is also about transnational relations. What are transnational relations? The relations between people between different groups, between organizations belonging to different countries, which can also be termed as track 2 diplomacy. Track 1 diplomacy is related to interaction between governments, the government of one country with the government of another country. But track 2 diplomacy emphasizes upon people to people contact in that there can be student to student con contact, academician to academician contact, NGO to NGO contact. So, international relations should be viewed more broadly with transnational relations that is relation between people, groups, organizations belonging to different countries. So, sociological liberalism suggests that political class can have its own limitations. They can have their own vested interest. So, do not be solely dependent on the interaction between the governments. It is better to have interaction between people. Classical example of people to people contact can be India Nepal relations. Although the government of Nepal and government of India may or may not have very good relations, but credit goes to people to people contact that borders never got close between India and Nepal. So, sociological liberalism is a approach which can address trust deficit. If there is lack of trust between the countries, those trust, those lack of trust 
can be avoided with the help of people to people contact. So, sociological liberalism support the policies like open borders, visa liberalization, visa on arrival. So, as per James Rosno, he is the supporter of sociological liberalism and he says, we are living in a society centric world. There is a considerable decline in the capacities of the states to keep surveillance on borders. So, if the capacities of the states are declining, we should focus on more people to people contact because international relations is not the exclusive domain of governments. We all have to do with international relations. We all get affected because of international relations. Talking about the contribution of Karl Deutsch, he is given communication theory. Communication theory is based on interaction between states. And Karl Deutsch observed that if the amount of interaction is high, it will result in the formation of security community. What is security community? There are two words security and community. So, security community basically denotes the set of persons who do not consider each other as threat like realism. In realism, everyone is threat for every other one, but this concept emphasizes that if we develop a security community, we will not consider each other as threat, rather we will view each other as friends as security provider. Now, next is the theory of functionalism. What is functionalism? It is also known as piece by pieces. Both are pronounced as piece, but one is P E A C E and other is P I E C E. The first one is peace that is prosperity, that is no war and second one is in different parts. They say that the theory of functionalism that issues can be resolved if there will be compartmentalization of issues. What does that mean compartmentalization of issues? For example, India and Pakistan, we have so many issues between us, but if you number, give numbers to the problem, which is, which is the more conflictual issue, which is the less conflictual issue. The most conflictual issue is of course, the Kashmir issue, the second is terrorism, although India considers terrorism as the most conflictual issue and Pakistan considers Kashmir as the most conflictual issue. These two are the prominent issue between India and Pakistan. So, whenever the government of these two countries interact with each other, Pakistan talks about Kashmir and India talks about terrorism and then all the talks fail. But if we go by the theory of functionalism, there can there are other problems also. For example, the problem of Sir Creek, water issue, trade issue. So, if we go by this theory that is a theory of functionalism, we should first try to resolve the less conflictual issue like the trade, we should talk about trade, we should talk about Sir Creek, 
then we can move to Siachen glacier and then we can further move to these most conflictual issues. And it is a natural instinct of human being that if you achieve one thing, you gain confidence to achieve the other also. So, liberals believe in the fact that if we try to achieve peace in the form of pieces, if we compartmentalize the issues, if we segregate the issues and if we try to resolve the issue which in which the low politics in involve, we can move towards high politics also. We can move towards resolving the most conflictual issues also. So, it believes that cooperation in low political issues will teach the benefits of cooperation, will make countries optimistic and we can hope for resolving the more conflictual issues also. Then the theory of neo-functionalism. This theory was outlined by Ernest B. Haas and he advocates that cooperation in one area will have a spillover effect in other areas. So, if you talk about neo-functionalism, the crux of the theory of neo-functionalism is a spillover. If there is cooperation in one area, it can lead to cooperation in other areas also. So, basically the principle of spillover refers to mechanism by which interaction in one area can create condition, can create situation, can have intensive to integrate in other areas also. So, if we interact in economic area and we if we have a very good economical relation, that economical relation can have a spillover effect on the political relation also. So, one area affect the other area because unlike realism which believes in the fact that politics is autonomous, international politics is autonomous. Liberalism do not believe in that principle. They say that everything is related to other. So, cooperation in one field can lead to cooperation in other field also. And this cooperation will create functional linkages and when there will be functional linkages, it will lead to interdependence and when interdependence will increase, if you are dependent on somebody for food or for any item of necessity, you will not go for war with that person. In the same way, if any nation is dependent on any other nation, that nation will not go for war with that other nation. So, interdependence will increase to that extent that countries will never go for war. And thus, neo-functionalism is a very powerful tool for the analysis of European Union. European Union has been an regional organization where two countries that were having animosity with each other that is France and Germany, they work together and European Union can be considered as 
one of the best examples of regional integration. So, it is because of this principle of neo functionalism that European Union achieved its goal of having peace in Europe. Next is the democratic peace theory. What is democratic peace theory? This theory basically states that countries with liberal democratic forms of government are less likely to go for war with each other. So, two democracies do not go for war with each other and this idea evolved from the writings of Immanuel Kant and Woodrow Wilson. Michael Doyle is also one of the prominent scholar of this theory. So, basically this theory advocates that democracies form zone of peace. If two democracies or three democracies are there that itself becomes a zone of peace because countries will not go for war with each other because democracies promote a culture of toleration. They believe in the rights of individuals. They emphasize on the welfare of individuals. So, because they emphasize on the welfare of individuals, they do not go for war because war is not good for anyone and the world has already seen two world wars and its effects also that how it impacted the human being, how it impacted the society, how it impacted the infrastructure. So, economically, politically, socially, culturally in every sphere war has a major negative impact. So, better to opt democracies because democracies have a pacifist culture and what is that pacifist culture? That is the culture of toleration. Even if a country, country A for example, makes some mistake, country B can tolerate that mistake because they believe in freedom. They have the space of accommodation. They respect each other. They consider other person view as as important as their own. So, as per democratic peace theory, democracies form a zone of peace where there is no war. So, in democracies people develop a habit to resolve the dispute. How? Through dialogue rather than force because in realism realists consider that force is important because force help us to resolve our issues. But in liberal theory and especially in democratic peace theory, they believe that we can resolve our issues through dialogue. There is no need to use force to resolve our issues. And why countries do like that? It is the pressure of public opinion. It is because of the pressure of public opinion that countries avoid to go for war. It is because of the pressure of public opinion that if any commitment is made by any country, they tend to keep that promise. And in international relations as per liberal point of view, it is not easy for states to overlook public opinion. 
because the opinion of other country matters because we are dependent on that country. Our image, our status matters. So, because in democracies there is freedom of speech and expression and if we have the freedom of speech and expression, it is very natural that we will have a degree of toleration because we are mentally prepared for the critical examination and critical examination of any decision is good because it will give a chance to correct. But democratic peace theory is also subject to some criticism because there has been incidences when two democracies uh, have fought uh, because uh, if two countries do not go for war two major democracies, it can be a coexistence. So, as democratic peace theory claims that democracies form a zone of peace. The critics of democratic peace theory claims that if there is no war between any major democracies, it can just be a coincidence. And democratic peace theory offers limited explanatory, limited explanation of power politics. They do not give a broad explanation of power politics. Democratic peace theory basically legitimize the action of USA because we have seen the time from 1990 when USA has introduced democracy at gunpoint. So, if democracies claim itself to form a zone of peace, then how can we achieve democracy at gunpoint? That was the doctrine of Bush, Bush doctrine. Even from communist point of view, it is an attempt to regime change, to install puppet government in the name of democracies. Countries go to establish puppet government like USA did in many of the West Asian countries. So, it is a kind of legitimization of the wrong deeds in the name of democracy. Next is the theory of complex interdependence. This theory of complex interdependence in international relations was given by Robert Q. Hen and Joseph Nye in late 1970s. And this concept is a basically neoliberal critique of the liberal viewpoint, the realist viewpoint. So, the the this theory that is a theory of complex interdependence analyzes that how international politics is transformed by interdependence. According to the theory of complex interdependence, states and their future are extremely tied to each other. Each nation is dependent on some other nation. There is interdependence, but that interdependence is complex in nature. We can have very good economic relations, but we are fighting at the borders. So, what kind of interdependence is that? That is complex interdependence. Now, two, there are two words, two concepts interdependence and complex interdependence. 
what is the difference between interdependence and complex interdependence? In the post war complex interdependence is basically qualitatively different from interdependence. Previously international relations were directed by state leaders. There was the use of military force and the use of military force was the only option in case of conflict between national leaders. The high politics of security and survival had priority over the low politics of economics and social affairs. But now the reality is something else. The relation between states nowadays are not only or primarily the relation between state leaders. They are relations on many levels, many different levels, different actors, different branches of government and transnational relations are there that we talked about in sociological liberalism. So, now the military force is less powerful instrument of policy under the theory of complex interdependence. So, complex interdependence involve multiple channels of action between societies. There is absence of hierarchy of issues changing or different agendas. Bringing a decline in the use of military force power has been the main goal of relations. So, in conclusion, the core argument of liberalism is concentration of power is threat to individual liberty. It is restrained as timeless notion. Liberal norms add limitation to the use of power because it and they also of behavior is appropriate. Table power can only be restrained with the help of the institution both domestic and international level. The organization limit the power of states. Today, it is clear that liberalism is, it is not a utopian theory that liberalism is accused of being. Liberalism provides a consistent, it is firmly rooted in evidence, tradition. I hope I have brought light to all the different strands of liberalism.